Cops of Reddit. What's the most fake sounding excuse that you got that actually turned out to be true? Cop here. Got a call of a domestic dispute that sounded very heated and a lot of banging was heard. Get to scene and I can hear someone yelling and swearing and brawling. It doesn't sound good at all. Guy answers the door shirt off and angry, but seems bewildered as to why police had been called. He told me he was building IKEA furniture. Sounds like the most fake thing ever. But we enter and we see the new IKEA furniture half set up and no one else is home. Color me surprised. Ugh, these days you can't even rage in your own home building Ikea. What is the world coming to? Story 2. I'm running booking one night. Guy gets brought in for possessing a truly stupendous amount of drugs. I'm talking like two rubber-made totes full of shrooms, a huge bag of weed, and enough H to overdose half the country. Well, says he, I'm a DEA informant and they told me to make the drop so they could be there and raid the crap out of everyone and let me go for helping. Uh-huh, right, face left, please. Guy is like, I'm telling you, dude, they're gonna be super pissed that you country idiots screwed up their bust. Yeah, whatever, get in the holding cell and shut up. About three hours later, three guys show up. DEA agents. They're super mad that our deputies screwed up their bust. Look at that. I go back to the holding cell to let the guy out and he's just like, they're super pissed, huh? Yeah. Told you so. Story 3. Former Dutch police slash military thing here. We also had jurisdiction over the American soldiers who were stationed here. One day, we got called over to a possible case of domestic violence. We arrive at the house and the guy opened the door wearing only underwear. He told us he and his wife were role-playing. Of course, we did not trust this and we asked to see his wife. After denying us entry, we told him we could come back with a warrant. He reluctantly agreed to let us enter. So we go in and he opened the basement door and inside was the freakiest banging dungeon. I'm talking chains, whips, things I couldn't identify, all hanging on the wall. And in the middle, hanging in chains, was his butt-naked, gagged wife. We asked her, but she said everything was good. Turned out they were just really into some frisky stuff. Asked them to keep the screaming part in the basement and to a minimum. We did the whole thing with a straight face, but as soon as we were in the car, oh. <laughs> the Dutch military police thing had a word, but I have no idea how to say it, and it's Dutch, so my brain can't even comprehend it. If someone knows what it is, I'm sure you'll put it in the comments. Story 4. I'll throw my hat into the ring as a defense attorney. Guy pulled over for impaired driving and charged later with OWI. My boss gets the criminal complaint and the guy shows up for his initial appearance and tells her he hadn't been drinking, despite horrifically failing the sobriety test. She's literally sitting next to him and he's obviously wasted again, disappointing but not uncommon for alcoholics. The deputies arrest him for bail jumping because he drove himself to court that day, and while out on bail he's not supposed to drink. He adamantly denies drinking. Blood tests come back. He didn't drink. Dude's diabetic without knowing it and naturally got himself drunk because sometimes when it goes untreated, diabetes can cause symptoms that look like intoxication. Got him some insulin and the charges were dismissed. Story 5. I was driving with my fiancé and we went through a roadblock and they checked registration and stuff. We get to the cops, they ask for our registration. I'm sitting in the passenger seat so I open up the glove box and right there is a clear, unmarked baggie filled to the brim with catnip. I completely forgot it was there and just froze. Wide-eyed, I turn to look at the cop shining his light through my window and he's frozen too. Just staring at the baggie with the look on his face that's like, really? I just started immediately professing, oh my god, I swear to god this is catnip. You can take it and smell it or test it or whatever, I swear. At this point, it's just so ridiculous that I start cracking up. And the cop takes it and reasonably deduces I'm telling the truth. He starts laughing and calls his partner over and tells her what happened and they both just cackled away for a minute and sent us on our way. Most understanding cop for real for real. People have been detained for way less. Story 6. Okay, so I'm gonna tell my crazy story as the person behind the wheel. My uncle was divorcing his terrible wife. He was no saint, but definitely on the right side of their divorce. The wife was still on the paperwork to take their two kids out of the school, even though my uncle had temporary custody while the courts did their thing. She had previously threatened to take both of them and just run away, so I don't know why she was still on the paperwork. On picture day that year, she showed up to the school and signed both kids out and disappeared. I was not involved in the crazy process of calling the police and tracking the kids down, but I was pulled from school that day because I had my driver's license and could be an extra pair of hands. They managed to find the kids and they were turned over to my grandmother and mom but my niece was distraught that she would be missing picture day. It was her first time away from her terrible mother, and she was finally allowed to be a cheerleader, a dream in her tiny eyes. So me, having my car and nothing better to do, offered to take her back to school. My mom got the school to agree to keep the person there a little longer, but it was going to be by the skin of our teeth. We got in the car and I blasted it down those dirt roads of rural Oklahoma, doing approximately 70 in a 35. Not a good decision on my part, but I was an anxiety-ridden 17-year-old dealing with a nasty divorce and kidnapping for the first time in my life. We, 
of course, get pulled over. I'm freaking out because I can't afford that bad of a ticket. As well as just all the crap that was coming in that day. The cop listened to the story and ignored my barely held tears and said he would let us off with a warning because he believed us. And the only reason he believed it was that he'd just pulled over my uncle going the same speed the opposite direction on the same road and got the same story. That is an incredible coincidence. I wonder if the cop believed the uncle, or if he still ticketed him. Story 7. Not a cop, but heard it said to one. EMS. Go to a woman who had been attacked by her cat. Her injuries were crazy, covered in blood. Her scalp is literally shredded, huge lacerations, etc. I know cats are known to do some damage, but the story wasn't fitting, and she was so sketchy about anyone going into her house. Adamantly refuses to let anyone inside because she thinks they're going to take away her cat. He didn't mean to, he was just excited by the birds. Her cat was a lynx. There's an important detail that's missing here. Did she know it was a lynx? Some people get like wolves or whatever and they're like, big dog, uh, they get it when it's small and they grow up with it and they're like, it's a big dog, I love him, you know? So did she know it was a lynx? If so, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. If not, unlucky. Although at some point you gotta start asking questions. Story 8. I was the one with the excuse. Forgot my keys at a friend's place before going out drinking that night. Get home at 2am, no keys. Only one of our windows didn't have ghetto bars, so I took the screen out and started pushing and smacking it up. Locks were on the sides, only providing friction. As I'm halfway in, I just feel... Wump. Got tackled into the house. The officer was still outside, holding onto my ankles. I look up and just said, I'm astonished by your response time. I actually live here. Let me get up, unlock the door, and give you my ID. So I did. He stares at it for a second and then says, Sorry, and sprints off to look for the person they were actually looking for. Story 9. Not a cop. Family friend was. Pulled a guy over who was speeding profusely. Guy was obviously disheveled. He said he was headed to the hospital because he had a tick on his dong. Cop was confused, but he escorted him there. Then waited in the lobby to check on him slash see if he was blowing smoke. After a while, he asked the desk what was going on, why it took so long to get a tick off his dong. Her reply, it wasn't on it, it was in it. Well, that is psychological damage I will never recover from. Thanks for that, OP. Story 10. My dad was a cop, and my favorite story of his goes like this. He's a young cop in a rough neighborhood. It's so late that the stoplights are flashing red, meaning treat it like a stop sign. Out of nowhere, this pink caddy goes rolling through the intersection. My dad pulls him over. A big black dude was driving. The caddy had fur interior, dice in the mirror, a real PIMP car, if you know what I mean. My dad goes, Sir, do you know that you ran the light back there? And this guy says, Officer, I do believe I got between the flashes. My dad was laughing so hard he had to let the guy go. No, I am not going to do a big black dude voice. Sorry, that's the best you're gonna get. This channel is on its way up. I don't want it to get cancelled. No thank you. Story 11. Former cop here. I was behind a vehicle that couldn't stay in the lane, kept swerving, etc. It was 1am and I think, ah, oh, another drunk idiot on the road. Pull him over, guy's a straight up jerk to me, cursed me out, yelling at me, and I notice his speech is slurred. I get him out of the car and I can smell a fruity smell on his breath and he has to lean against the car for support. I ask him how much he had to drink and he tells me to screw off. By this point, I'm ready to bring him in for a DUI. But I felt something just wasn't right. I called EMS to check on him and his blood sugar was at 40. Not drunk, just a diabetic. If I would have arrested him, he probably would have died before I finished paperwork. Go with your gut if something doesn't seem right. Story 12. Not a cop, but I have a pretty good one. In high school, some of my buddies sold weed. Driving around in a car with a scale, baggies, and two to four ounces at any given time. One day, T and E decide to go to a really good taco stand for lunch in between deliveries. E is driving. They're making their way downtown when E starts laughing. E. Did you see that? T. Uh, no, what? E. I'll turn around, you gotta see this. T. Dude, don't get us pulled over. What the- chill. E makes a U-turn and turns down the street. Nothing there, so he stops in front of a random house to look around. What the hell was it? Just drive. I saw a dude pushing a stroller with two wiener dogs in it. You're an idiot. As soon as E started driving again, a cop car pulls behind them and lights him up. Cop 1. Ahem. <clears throat> What are you guys doing? E, panicking a bit. I saw a guy pushing a stroller with wiener dogs in it and I had to show my friend. Cop 2. How come you're parked in front of this known trap house and your car smells like dope? T. Silence. E. This guy with a stroller and... Cops. Get out of the car. Car gets searched. They find everything. As they're getting loaded into the back of the cop car all handcuffed up, Cop 2 just stops. Hey, Cop 1, look at that. No crap. Everyone looks up at this old guy pushing a stroller with his two wiener dogs poking their heads out. Cops burst out laughing. They both got charged with possession and trafficking. Good times. I just want to say, E is peak stoner vibes. Hopefully the charges they got hit with weren't that bad. It sounds like those cops were kind of chill, but they're not the ones who make the final call on that stuff, so. Story 13. I had a run-in with the cops a few years ago, and I wonder what exactly they thought when they first stopped me. I had taken a cab back from a work party, and uh, I was pretty drunk. My friend and I had just moved to this new apartment, so I accidentally gave the cab driver the wrong address. 
I ended up on a block that looked very similar to mine and a building that looked like mine. There were two doors before getting to my apartment door, which was on the first floor. Like my apartment building, they left the first door unlocked and locked the second. I kept trying my keys to open it, but I couldn't and was confused. I went outside to look for my car and it wasn't parked there. That's when I realized yeah, I was on the wrong block. I started walking in the direction I thought my apartment was in when a cop car pulls up. They ask me what I'm doing. I tell them, I'm really drunk and I just want to go home, which was the honest truth. They told me they got a call about someone trying to get into an apartment building. I guess the people in that building woke up and thought I was trying to break in. They were super suspicious of me at first, but it eventually became clear I was just a drunk idiot and not a burglar. They ran me through to make sure I didn't have any warrants or anything, and when I checked out, they offered me a ride home. The ride back was hilarious, because when we were getting back to my apartment, I tried telling them that it was a bit complicated to get to because of all the one-way streets. The officer driving was like, Who do you think you're with? and then turned on the lights and went the wrong way down the street to get me home faster. It honestly felt like I was with the two cops from Superbad. Story 14. This was my favorite story from my fourth grade teacher, not a cop. She went to a cousin's wedding in mid-July. The cousin had overestimated how much champagne they would need at the reception and was giving away bottles to anyone who was interested. So my teacher took three and put them in the back seat of her car. Again, this was a hot summer day in July. After saying their goodbyes, my teacher, her husband, and her parents piled into the car and pulled out onto the highway, where two bottles burst open spraying champagne everywhere and causing quite a ruckus. Of course, while this was happening, the car was swerving as the driver was also getting bathed in sparkling champagne. So it came as no surprise that as soon as they collected themselves, they saw the familiar flashing lights of a state trooper and pulled over. According to my teacher, the first thing the cop said was, I'm not gonna ask if you've been drinking because I can smell it from here. My teacher tried to explain what had happened, but the cop wouldn't hear any of it, and ordered everyone out of the car. That's when the cop saw that everyone, both drivers and passengers, were dressed in their finery, but soaked with champagne and looking quite shaken. A cursory search showed the open bottles, but the cops still insisted on a quick sobriety check just to make sure. Story 15. Not a cop, but I once got pulled over by a fire truck. It was Orlando in August 1990. It was close to 100 outside. I worked for a computer rental company. We would rent computers to companies in town for trade shows or for a lot of other situations. The company van was a ragged out Chrysler minivan with 180k miles on it. The AC didn't work so the windows were open. I was coming back to the office in heavy rush hour traffic, and I found myself in a right turn only lane and couldn't get out in time, so I was forced to make the right turn. I hit the gas to speed up and get in front of the people making a left turn in my same direction. I had to get all the way over to the left side to make a U-turn, so I cut off a fire truck to do it. One of the big squarish fire trucks with the flat front. I cut them off and got in the left turn lane to wait for the green arrow. I looked out the window to my left and saw a Dixie Chopper lawnmower mowing the grass on the side of the road maybe 15 feet from me. It was already hot, but this tremendous wave of heat came through in the driver's side window. I thought, man, that's a hot lawnmower. The light turned green and I started my U-turn. Halfway through it, this cloud of, I thought, steam came out of the hood and covered the windshield so I couldn't see. The power steering also failed, so I fought the car trying to get back to the gas station at the corner so I could find a payphone. Yes, that's how old I am. But because I couldn't see, I missed the turn and ended up turning into an apartment complex. Complex. About this time, the cloud stopped and I could see again. Still no power steering. So I fought the car to do a U-turn so I could get back to the gas station. At this point, the fire truck I had cut off turned into the apartment complex, full lights, and blocked me in. Two huge firefighters got out of the truck holding fire extinguishers like beer cans. Excuse me, sir. Did you know your van was on fire? Turns out, while I was cutting them off, I'd been shooting flames out from under the passenger side of the van. They hit the lights, did a U-turn, and came back to me. The wave of heat wasn't from the mower. They checked out the van and let me go. The cause turned out to be a damn damaged power steering line. It sprayed power steering fluid all over the exhaust manifold and caught fire. Story 16. Former park ranger. First week in the job, we pull up and see a couple of kids smoking in their car with the windows down. The city has an ordinance against smoking on park property, but it's too petty to give them a ticket. We approach the car and they are visibly nervous. My FTO looks through the windows and sees a couple of beer cans in the car. Bingo. We get them out and start running their info. They are all underage, but old enough to smoke cigarettes. My FTO asks them where the beer came from. The driver says he recycles. FTO laughs and begins to search the car. I'm finishing up running their info and these guys are being really respectful. FTO finishes searching the cab and goes to the trunk. All of a sudden, I hear him bust out laughing. He is laughing so hard he can barely breathe. He waves me over to look at the trunk of the car, and it is level with crushed cans and bottles. My FTO said that he has heard this excuse for about 20 years, and this was the first time it was true. He walked up, uncuffed the driver, and let him go. Edit. There were a lot of interesting questions in the comments, and I felt the need to answer a few of them. FTO, field training officer. New officers are assigned a training officer out of the academy. The length of time they're assigned to an FTO varies by department. Handcuffed. In California and the US in general, cuff rights are very loose. 
The general rule of thumb is we can cuff you for officer safety if we have probable cause for a crime. In this situation, smoking in the park was all of the probable cause we needed. Beer and car. Open container laws vary from state to state. California has some of these stricter laws where you can get a DUI if the keys are in the car and you're drinking. I've heard that you can get a DUI as a passenger, but I would have to look it up. Story 17. I had an H addict who I arrested for a warrant. While searching her purse, I found a small container with a grayish slash brown substance in it, consistent with H. When I asked her what it was, she started laughing. She told me to test it because it wasn't drugs. I tested it and sure enough, the test came back negative. She explained to me that inside the container was the ashes of her dead cat. She said that when she goes to pick up H for her friends, she'll take some for herself and cut the rest with her cat's ashes. Her friends have been snorting or shooting up some of her dead cat. I guess my question is, do they know? Because that's pretty messed up if they don't. I mean, it's all kind of messed up, obviously, but like, it's pretty messed up if they don't know. On the other hand, whiskers will live forever. Or at least until the high comes down, which is not long. Story 18. Popped a college kid for crappy driving and pulled a hundred grams of weed off of him. Also a one pound glass pipe shaped like a huge nail. No biggie. Also find weed under the other college kids in the car. The driver falls on the sword and tells me all of it is his and lets his friends walk free. I like this kid. However, during the search we find packaged Addies in the cellophane of a cigarette pack with the top melted closed. God damn it intensifies. Ask kid if he's dealing Addies at school. Tell him I'm aware of the prescription pill epidemic. He says no. Spins a huge yarn about how he only carries a few on him because he's had his orange pill bottle stolen so many times. Kid seems like a pretty good dude. I decided to take the X-Files approach. Supervisor tells me pursue charges for dealing blah blah blah. I tell the kid he has one chance to prove he's telling the truth. He shows me the broken glass under his driver's seat from a vehicle burglary. Gotta do better than that. I follow behind him back to his dorm and he lets me in. Shows me the busted footlocker he kept them in under his bed. I don't know, kinda weak? Supervisor's telling me to hurry up and drop the axe. Tell him to do better. He calls one of the soccer team assistants up and we meet him in the locker room. Shows me the little wooden locker which has a broken lock. Eh. Assistant coach tells me they've replaced the lock on his cabinet three times. Campus security has numerous reports of medicine theft from this kid. Nice. I call supervisor up and tell him I have no grounds to pursue delivery charges. Poor bastard just kept getting his Adderalls jacked and being the dumb meatball he was, he started packaging them like that. I ended up talking to his best friend breaking up a house party a couple months later. Friend tells me kid is a stand-up guy who only uses weed due to extreme anxiety. Totally believable for my interaction with him. And has never sold anything in his life. Friend thanked me and told me his buddy spoke well of me. Friend also tells me he had to drive his buddy to the hospital a few hours after I left from a panic attack due to the whole incident. I felt bad for the kid. So now whenever I see him smoking up in his car in the mall parking lot, I just wave. Story 19. Was doing a tour as an MP. Not my normal job, but that's a whole other story. We got called on a domestic. At the house, there's this huge corn-fed guy about 6 foot 4 and 275, and a petite Asian girl about 4'10 and 95 pounds soaking wet. The whole house was in disarray, and the call had come in because of yelling heard by the neighbors. She was crying and talking in an Asian language that none of us understood, and she kept gesturing toward her huge husband. He wasn't talking. We wrap him up, take him to the station, and we're trying to interview him, but he's not saying much. We intend to charge him with domestic assault. We notice somewhere along the way that he has horrible welts all along the backs of his hands and along his forearms. It took a lot of prying, but we finally got out of him that his wife would beat him with wire coat hangers when she was mad. And apparently, that was pretty often. He was too embarrassed to admit to anybody that he was being abused by his wife who was less than a third of his size. We finally got it straightened out, turned her over to the local police, and barred her from base. Hopefully, the guy got the help he needed. Well, that's all the stories we have for now, and I think that's a decent one to end it on. Just a little reminder that anyone can be the victim of abuse. Appearances can be deceiving. It's important to take the time to really look into things and ask the right questions. But aside from that, most of these stories were pretty entertaining in here, so I hope you had some fun. I also hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are. I will see you in the next one.